I mean, what does it mean that there's so many petitions out there right now? I don't know, right? We're in uncharted waters. This hasn't ever happened in Utah before. The the um, pathway to get on the ballot via petition is a very, very difficult process. And from the legislative perspective, I think that that is by design. Um, and it, there's been very few uh, that have done it before. You have to, in my mind, you have to have both a money backer um, who has a, quite a bit of money they're willing to put in as well as fairly broad citizen support. It's not enough to have one or the other. You really need both. And as far as whether the rules should be changed at all, I, I, you know, we're going to live through this year and see what happens and then see what we think about that because <laughs> we've never really had this many on the ballot before. And so it's an unusual year and it's an exciting time. That protest is the voice of the unheard. And I'm going to say that petitions are the voice of the unheard. I think, uh, <laughs> I think we're living in a time right now where people's lives are being affected by the policies that we make and the policies that are coming out of Washington, D.C. And I think people are feeling, well, people are feeling that politicians don't understand how everyday people are being affected. Um, I do believe in petitions. I do believe in protesting. I'm all about a good protest. <laughs> I have been out there. Um, as long as the work goes in after the protest and the, and, the, and the petition and you keep pushing and pushing and pushing to make sure un those under people understand what's going on. Um, sometimes when you you personalize it a little bit, saying when your son or daughter graduates from college, they're going to need affordable housing. And sometimes when that when that happens, the light goes on. And, oh yeah, we're not. Everybody needs us. It's my son and my daughter. It's it's me. It's everybody. So. Um, and what it means, <clears throat> really, is that we're we're trying to catch up. And and so when you think about that, from 1990 to 2005, I think that we have something like 1,100 units of new housing built in Salt Lake City. So over a 15 year period, we just didn't see it. Most of that was in one development. So that gives you an idea of what we've been trying to respond to. Local governments feel this impulse to fill that gap, to fill that vacuum that the federal government in the past has been the, uh, the main uh, protagonist. Uh, for um, issues of opportunity and equity and social services. And so the issue, for example, of dealing with our issues with homelessness here is exactly one of those issues. Uh, Salt Lake City couldn't deal with it on its own, it, just the amount of resources that are needed, but also the complex division of labor that's going on between the state, the county, nonprofits, the city, um, needs coordination at a higher level. And so the coordination was absolutely a sine qua non for an issue like this, but it's it's all local. I mean, boy, we want more federal money, but we can't ignore the problem, and certainly the feds aren't going to save us. The feds are not providing solutions for a, a lot of these issues uh, that once we, at certain times, we we relied on them, really since LBJ and the Great Society, right, trying to solve significant uh, issues of civil rights with federal initiatives. Well, if those days are over, local governments are going to want to do a lot more than provide just basic city services. It's always a build. We're going to build this much affordable housing, and I, I have to say I don't think that's a very good solution. If you do that, if you put aside money and say we're going to build affordable housing, you'll get some people to build that, and those people will have enough money to hire lobbyists and come back to your committee and say, look, we built affordable housing, and we'll say the problem is solved. To me, this issue is a very basic issue of supply and demand. If a lot more people move here and we don't allow for higher density, and so the only places close by, there's just not enough of them and there are very few of them, we're gonna wind up like Boston and San Francisco and, and Denver over the last two years has seen their housing prices double and we're gonna be right behind them if we're not careful. To me, a better solution is to allow more supply so that it can just meet the demand and to, that becomes a city issue as opposed to a state issue uh, but if cities don't allow for higher density we're going to be in a lot of trouble uh, it just drives me crazy to see cities saying we will not allow mother-in-law apartments really 
That, I mean, the, the person who lives there, maybe that's an aging person who is otherwise going to be forced to lose their home, but they could stay in it. If you would let them have a mother-in-law apartment that they could get both the rent money and maybe somebody to help them out, we won't allow Airbnb. Maybe that's the, the amount of, I mean, you can't let the neighbor cause all their neighbors a bunch of problems, but maybe that's the thing that allows that single mom property owner to stay in her home. So my, my feeling is that those kind of solutions that allow more supply will do more good for us um, than the individual uh, projects. And, and I hope this is a big fight between the state and the cities because every city says, well, we can have more density, but not in my city, by gosh, that, well, the other cities can have that. Um, and I, I don't know how that will... It will work out, but that's going to be a, a big issue this session and in other sessions yet to come. Um, and then I think there's really an issue of um, equity and, and boundaries and, and where um, this goes to some of the not in my backyard um, issues where people have misperceptions about um, who affordable housing is or what it does to a community. And so we meet a lot of resistance and that can be a very big barrier. Um, especially when data shows that kids who live in um, areas of opportunity, as we call them, or areas that are rich in education and um, health care and food access and transportation, their income actually increases over their lifetime, statistically. And so when you can begin to create communities that are based in diversity, um, there's a lot of power, but the, the barrier to that is really helping our communities understand what that is and looks and feels like. Um, and that, that is a, a, a big challenge. One thing that I think is not working is um, how government communicates with the public and how the public communicates with government. I think we've had a breakdown in the last several years. And it's on both sides. Um, I think politicians are figuring out that it is really easy to, you know, I, if I, I accuse it, and I, I, I think it works better at the local level because there's direct communication really is the way, but it is easy to throw out an accusation and, you know, that wasn't transparent or that was secretive or that was, you know, I, politicians are figuring it out in the world of Twitter and uh, Facebook and it is easy to just make an accusation. You know, I see the debate about repealing Obamacare, and the comments are, um, it covers existing conditions. Well, no, it doesn't. But if you say it, people are going to believe it. And so I think how government communicates with the public has been severely distorted, and politicians are figuring out how to manipulate it. And I think also how the public communicates with government, there's such distrust and anger that that communication is breaking down as well. If you look at the very end of the second article, okay, the executive branch, Article 2, Section 4, the Constitution says the criteria for the peaceful nonviolent removal of a corrupt or government, corrupt or incompetent government official is treason, bribery, or high crimes and misdemeanors. Treason, bribery, or high crimes and misdemeanors. It doesn't say personality, <laughs> style, doesn't say um, in, in terms of positions, differing positions on public policy issues. Okay. I'm going to suggest to you the current president is testing in an unprecedented way the criteria for impeachment. The other thing that, and my colleague just said the same thing, is that we listen to you, but I'll tell you what works is a letter. If you care enough to write me a letter, I'd sit in right there. And I take it to work with me because you cared enough. Emails or whatever, and especially when they send it to hundreds of them. I'm not anybody. I'm just hundreds of one. So they're just fishing for somebody to pick up the idea. Well. I'm pretty busy gal and I'm not gonna you know if you want me if you want me to be the sponsor if you love me enough you'll come and talk to me you'll write me you come to visit me that's important to you but I'll tell you if you write a letter I have to open it up I have to look at it and you care enough to sit there and write that's important so for me if I that's number one on my list if somebody cares to write me or or calls me on the phone I have a landline at my house and that landline is designated to constituents. 
and it and it's all it's all on my stuff that I send out on my flyers. So there's that. So I know that landline is constituents, and I go through it like every two or three days to see that you know because like the colleagues have said, don't wait till the till the legislative session and send me a letter. I got 200 coming in a day. Call me before, and I know you it's concern for you. Call me after so we can nurture what your issue is for the next piece of legislation. Because sometimes legislation, there's we can fix stuff with that legislation if you've got an issue. You know, the writing's going to be on the wall. I think, too, you know, we, we humans have a bad habit of showing up for things we hate politically. If there's Man, if there's a bill I want to sink down, I'm going to show up. But, you know... I don't know, Housewives is on, on the bills I really think are good and I'll, I'll show up with, uh, or, or uh, basically we don't show up unless we're, we're angry. And I think, you know, the people in this room, most planning meetings I've ever been to in my life have a fifth of the people here. I mean, that are actual uh, yes or no. And they're almost always no. And so I think part of the reason we have the policies we do, especially in these more suburban cities, is because people that do care that their best reality includes a place in their city where everybody gets to live, just they're not there when that mayor is campaigning. They're not there in that planning meeting where they're going to rip away higher density zoning because it, it just it didn't call to them in the same way of something that they were negative about. So if you just, if, if everybody here just had a, like an idea where, you know what, Three times a year, I'm going to show up to a planning meeting and tell them I'd really like some zoning. The, the effect of that is massive. I mean, two or three people have swayed $100 million developments. It happens all the time. And those two or three people are almost always negative, even though the whole community might have agreed with it. So I, I, I just don't underestimate. You guys, uh, I mean, this is great, seeing this many people interested in voting. I mean, the, the whole concept behind this group is amazing and I think people greatly underestimate the power that just this room collectively could have so please go out and the next time whatever city to be named is considering down zoning a place or not including more density in an area that's just warehouses right now usually let them know just say look my best world my city's best world involves a place where everybody gets to live I think Carol Strawn over there has made uh, gerrymandering cookies, just in case you <laughs> want to take a bite out of redistricting. <laughs> no, they're really lovely.